This is Wayne Zell and welcome to Blueprint for Wealth, your video cast that helps clients and you realize your personal dreams of wealth and freedom. The video cast is brought to you by Zell Law, a full service law firm located in Reston, Virginia, but with offices in Savannah, Georgia, and soon to be Florida and Texas. And uh, today with me is my special guest, Michelangelo Mortolero, who is a Medicaid estate planning veterans benefits expert located in Tampa, Florida. Welcome, Michelangelo. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Absolutely. I, you know, we had a chance to talk briefly before uh, we got on this broadcast, and I've been uh, enamored with some of the things that you've been able to accomplish. Um, you are a graduate of Florida International University, and You've been practicing law for almost 20 years. I'd like to know how you got to specialize and get involved in Medicaid and veterans benefits particularly. Well, sometimes uh, it's better to be lucky than good. Um, I kind of fell into it when I went to law school. I originally thought everybody needed to be a litigator and that all lawyers had to be you know, Perry Mason in the courtroom. And, and taking some transactional courses, tax and estate planning, I really fell in love with the idea of transactional practice. Um, by nature, I'm a lover, not a fighter. So I think I would not be um, fulfilled um, in my career choice if I had to go to court every day and you know let's let's dig it on them before they dig it on us. It's just not my personality. So being from Tampa um, here, family's been in, in Tampa for over 130 years and my family knows a lot of people. And so I thought what area of practice would be good that I could offer my services on a transactional basis to the most amount of people that we have connections with. And estate planning just became a natural fit for that. Um, at least in our area, 80 plus percent of individuals have no estate planning, um, no succession planning in their business. And so it was kind of low hanging fruit. So I started with general estate planning, had clients that were passing away. Uh, and then based on that, um, I had clients that were, um, so we picked up probate. So clients were passing away. And so I figured, well, we'll learn probate. And then the magic happened. I started having clients that were not passed away yet, but not healthy anymore. And I was sending work out to other attorneys that were focused on elder law, Medicaid and veterans benefits. And quite honestly, I saw some of the fees coming back and I was like, wow, I got to sling four or five estate plans for what these guys and girls are getting on one Medicaid case. Certainly it's lucrative um, and, and at some point uh, it's not building rockets, we can figure it out. So that's how the, the model started. Um, the real story, which you can't make up stuff this entertaining. Uh, prior to getting married, I was on match.com and uh, I was hit up by a young lady in Orlando, which is about an hour and a half from us. And she said, hey, I see you're a lawyer too. We should meet for a drink. And I said, you know, you live an hour and a half away from me. And she said, I'll drive to Tampa. I said, I'll buy you a drink. <laughs> so she came into Tampa. We met for a beer and she asked about my practice. And I said, estate planning. And she said, do you do elder law? I said, no. And she said, you're an idiot. And I said, oh, I see this state's going. I immediately fell in love with her. <laughs> so the so funny thing about that, um, she ended up, uh, the, the relationship went nowhere on a romantic side, but she was very generous with her time, became a mentor. And she uh, got me, helped get me accredited through the VA. Uh, she allowed me to go shadow her in Orlando for a couple of days. And I really kind of learned her tips and techniques on uh, conducting an elder law uh, consultation. Um, and so, yeah, uh, online dating is what got me to be an elder law attorney. Uh, in short. <laughs> so, uh, right so place. Right right com doesn't necessarily result in successful marriages, but it does uh, help develop business. It, it, is a, it is a cornerstone of my practice, thanks to online dating and Match.com. So thank you. When we were talking the other day, you were telling me some really interesting facts about Florida Medicaid, and I, I'd like to drill into that a little bit. Um, some of the comments you made really surprised me. Why is Florida such a great state in which to qualify for Medicaid benefits? What, what makes it different and unique from everywhere else? And can you give us a couple of examples of how it works down in Florida? Absolutely. So I always tell my clients that Florida is the best place in the country to get old and sick in. And so I think there's a few reasons for that. One is uh, we have a lot of senior voters who are active here. So our lobbyists are very 
powerful and they go up to our state capitol in Tallahassee and they meet and greet with our legislators and they basically tell them either you're going to vote for this bill because it's good for our seniors or we have this little magazine called AARP and some old people read it and next election cycle we're going to tell everybody how much you hate old people and how much your competitor loves old people so do you want to vote for this uh and i think it's pretty much in florida political suicide if you do not uh, stay in line in voting for bills and legislation that are helpful to our seniors and so i think that's how we got our laws but some of the things that we can do learning it in florida and never having exposure to other states like i just thought that's how it worked and going to national conferences and talking with other elder law attorneys and other clients now that have come in from other states that have had experience with their Medicaid systems, I really have found why Florida is such a gem when it comes to this practice area. Why? So some of the ideas, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Why is it so so generous? Why is it so different? So what makes it different? I'll give you a couple of examples. I always pick mm -hmm. on New York. Um, I love New York. It's a fun place, but they are one of the most stringent uh, states in the country for getting Medicaid benefits. Right. So in a state like New York, you better go see an elder law attorney, preferably in your early 60s while you're still healthy, and you better set up some irrevocable trust planning so that uh, you can run the clock on that Medicaid five-year look-back period. Because in New York, if you haven't started planning five years before your catastrophic health event that requires you to have in-home care, assisted living, memory care, skilled nursing, you are going to be required most likely to spend down some or all of your assets to below $2,000 before New York Medicaid will kick in. So the idea is that- and By the way, we have the same, same law in Virginia. It's, it works okay. exactly the same way. So in Florida, um, we have lots of strategies that fully avoid the five-year look back period. One of the strategies is if you are married, we have an unlimited intrust spousal transfer so basically I can take all of the uh, marital assets and I can just retitle them or move them as far as ownership over to the healthy spouse, impoverish on paper the less healthy spouse, and then uh, apply for Medicaid. Now there's a, a few catches to that. Uh, okay. We have something called a, a CISRA or a Community Spouse Resource Allowance, which is about 137,000, maybe the same for you guys. Yes. Anything below the 137, you know, super easy. You just file the paperwork, document the transfers, and you're off to the races. But in Florida, we have something called spousal refusal. And it sounds harsh, but the premise behind spousal refusal is that the healthier spouse gets all the money in their name and then signs a series of documents basically saying, it's my money and I'm not taking care of my spouse. And people often have a knee jerk, like, well, wait a minute, that, that sounds terrible. And, well, it does sound terrible, but it's very effective. And so, Medicaid in Florida will say, well, you know, the, the couple had $4 million of assets, husband had a stroke, wife took it all in her name and now says she's not going to care for the husband. Well, we'll do it. And so Medicaid in Florida jumps right in and gives an approval. It works every time. Um, so that's unlimited spousal uh, transfers and spousal. So let me reviews. ask you about that a little bit, just drilling into that. So this, the spouse who uh, inherits the assets basically says, I will not, I refuse to take care of my spouse and therefore it allows the impoverished spouse to qualify. It, does that mean that they cannot, uh, provide any support for the impoverished spouse? And if that is the case, um, you know, is it enforced? So yes and no, all, all legal answers start with, it depends. <laughs> and so in this particular answer, it depends. Uh, to your point, we cannot use spousal refusal if they are cohabitating. So if they're living in the same house, then that doesn't work. But anytime the uh, less healthy spouse, or we call them the, uh, the institutional spouse uh, as a term of art, whenever they are living outside the house in some sort of a custodial care facility, assisted living, memory care, skilled nursing, then it works. Now, technically, the state of Florida does ha reserve the right to kind of go back after the healthier spouse that, that executed the spousal refusal, but that strategy has been around for about 25 years and to date, uh, Florida has never exercised that right. So I tell my clients that in theory, the state can come after you, but you'd be the first. And so it hasn't happened. And maybe that's a political uh, motivation of why they have chosen not to go after 
the nice little old lady who is trying to just conserve enough money to take care of herself or himself, depending on the situation. So what, in, in practice then, what can the wealthy spouse do for the benefit of the impoverished spouse using these assets that they've inherited? Anything? Pretty much anything. Um, once Medicaid gives the approval in Florida, uh, it's pretty much a hands-off approach. Uh, wow. Of course, the, the institutional spouse does need to have a Medicaid renewal each year, but that renewal only looks at income and assets. It doesn't look at other ancillary support. So it works really well. Uh, I've never had a problem. And I've done over 6,000 Medicaid asset protection cases here in Florida. Uh, we have sheltered over $600 million mm. uh, for people that otherwise would have to spend down. And so I've, I've never had a problem with it. Uh, I suppose at some point in the future, it might become a problem. But as lawyers, we sometimes uh, can only be proactive to a certain point. And then we need to wait and see what happens and we may need to be reactive in the future but and there haven't been any problem there hasn't been any published uh or or even uh unwritten announcements that they might try to enforce no. uh some type of enforcement action against the, no. the wealthy spouse or the inheritance. Don't, don't jinx me but no yeah let's <laughs> let's not talk too much about that um what other what other techniques are you using in in terms of florida uh, Medicaid and veterans benefits that uh, we should we should learn about or that the listeners should know about. So Florida also has a, a bunch of things that again I'll, I'll pick on New York. If you own a home in the state of New York, um, there is requirements that you will give New York an interest in your home or even sign over the home in exchange for benefits. In Florida, your home is typically exempt. Your homestead is exempt, and um, they don't come back after it. So Florida has what's called a narrow definition of a state recovery, which means that the Medicaid folks uh, will only try to recover Medicaid dollars from the probate estate. So as long as we avoid probate and we can do that through trusts, we can do that in Florida through something called a ladybird deed or an enhanced life estate deed. I believe only five states in the country recognize that. Uh, other states call it a beneficiary's deed. But as long as we keep assets out of probate, there is no venue for Medicaid estate recovery to come in and say, hey, judge, um, we spent a bunch of money on Mr. Smith's care and we'd like to be paid back. So relatively straightforward, as long as you keep them out of probate, they are off to the races. So the home is exempt. Uh, in Florida, your qualified retirement money, 401ks, 403bs, IRAs uh, are fully exempt. Of course, you do have to recognize your required minimum distribution as an income item. And we'll typically divide that by 12 and annualize the income so that we have a, a stable income to work with. So it, it may or may not cause a income problem, but here in Florida, and then I think in many other states, we can use, utilize a strategy called a qualified income trust or a QIT to fix the over income problem. So it's a problem, but it's really not a problem. The fix works every single time and it's, it's relatively easy to implement. So qualified money is exempt. Your house is exempt. We can take all non-exempt money ditch it to your healthier spouse if you have one and utilize spousal refusal if necessary. If you don't have a healthier spouse, so let's say you're single, widowed, divorced, then we can utilize something called a personal caregiver agreement or a personal services contract mm -hmm. where we can contract with a family member to provide care. Because the, the theory behind that is if, if you didn't have a family member coming to take you to the doctor and fill your pill box and help bathe you and dress you, you have to pay someone. Somebody and would have to come help you. Yeah, absolutely. So here's the cool thing. We can front load the contract for statistical life expectancy. So you have someone who is, you know, you have a, a an 80 year old female, let's say statistically, she has 10 years of life expectancy mm -hmm. and son or daughter comes over and helps mom from time to time. Um, now, of course, we need to make sure that we stay on the right side of the, the, um, honesty uh, fence here. So if we have someone whose children are not active in, in their care and oversight, it would completely be inappropriate to, to say by contract that they are. But mm -hmm. many times uh, we do have families that are very gracious with their time when it comes to their parents and they do help. So we can set up, let's say daughter does, you know, 10 hours a week for mom and we can pay her $50 an hour. So we have $500 a week, 52 weeks in a year, times 10 years of life expectancy. We can front load that contract. Even if mom 
you know, unfortunately is in hospice or is not doing well. And we know she's never going to make the statistical life expectancy. Florida Medicaid lets us use the chart. And so we can use the full life expectancy, front load the contract, move the money down to the daughter. Now, of course, there's a tax implication. So we're always cautious to talk to our clients about that and make sure the juice is worth the squeeze. Um, but another strategy that we layer with the caregiver agreement is something called a Medicaid D4C pooled trust. And D4C is the Medicaid provision that authorizes it. Um, not to get too much into my trade secrets, but we have a way um, that we can put money and assets into this D4C trust. Medicaid immediately takes a hands-off approach. And then we do have a strategy um, at end of life for handling those assets, which does not include payment of the Medicaid lien. Awesome. So there is significant benefit to utilizing not only uh, the Florida Medicaid environment, but using your law firm to help them navigate it because you really have created a uh, special sauce to take advantage of these uh, benefits in, in a way that maybe others aren't aware of. And so one for the listeners out there, consider Florida as a great place to retire and qualify for Medicaid, even if you have significant assets and you're married. And second, uh, talk to Michelangelo because he's got a lot of great ideas and he's executed them successfully over many years. Um, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, I know you also have a firm called Fortress Asset Protection. What does that company do and uh, how do clients avail themselves of that? Sure. Uh, so Fortress Asset Protection is kind of a spinoff of the asset protection that we already do on a daily basis for veterans and Medicaid benefits. And the idea is restructuring assets in a way that allow you to get public benefits that otherwise you'd be denied based on the means test or income and asset analysis. And so we started thinking about and I started looking at asset protection in general uh, from the estate planning perspective. So what happens if uh, if you get sued? Um, you know, what's nailed down, what's not? As many people know, uh, sometimes thanks to the O.J. Simpson uh, debacle is that Florida has very strong homestead protection. So in Florida, if you get sued, um, the, the creditor, the plaintiff um, cannot put a lien against your house and they can't foreclose on your house unless they are your bank, the mortgage company, homeowners association or property taxes. Those are the only three that will make you go live under a bridge if you don't pay them. Everybody else, um, they can put a personal judgment against you, but they can't touch your house. Also in Florida, uh, qualified retirement money um, annuities, cash value of life insurance policies, uh, social security and pensions are also exempt from garnishment. So really it's your non-qualified cash and investments. And so there's a number of strategies. Uh, one of the easiest ones is called, if you're married, um, is called TBE or tenants by the entireties. We can set up a TBE account totally free at your financial institution in most cases. And the TBE works in that if either of the spouses get sued and get a personal judgment, the creditor can attack TBE money. Now, that's helpful unless husband and wife get sued together, in which case the TBE is not so not so great. But we started thinking and talking and, and implementing strategies for clients for personal asset protection. Um, and we're dealing with in-state Florida irrevocable trusts. We can use Nevada uh, has a great DAP or domestic asset protection protection strategy uh, statute that we can use. And we can also do offshore uh, for people that really want to get uh, creative and get their money outside of the U.S. jurisdiction. So we started doing that for high net worth individuals. And then we uh, I met a great guy, Jason Sampson, who's my partner in Fortress, and he has done uh, business law and business litigation for over 20 years. And all he does is represent businesses. And we had lunch one day and I said, hey, how many of your business owners have their business interests coordinated with their estate plan? And he looked at me and said, none. And I said, like, none, like not a lot. And he said, no, none, like none. And I said, uh, opportunity. And so from that moment, um, I think within 24 hours, he started referring me business and I started referring him business. And we had so much referral business that at some point we sat down over a cigar and a, and a bourbon and said, why don't we just open a company that's dedicated to business owners, real property investors, high net worth individuals that haven't planned. And so now we do customized uh, seminars for physicians, for dentists, for the trades, and we identify areas of risk. And we also bring in insurance partners. So we want to make sure you're properly insured. 
And even if you're not properly insured, that we can nail down all of your assets that would otherwise be subject to creditor claims. And 83% of business owners have no estate plan. So it's really low hanging fruit for us um, that we can get in, educate them, and not only pick up the asset protection strategies in Fortress, but also pick up the general estate plan. From there, we also do downstream asset protection where we can make it more difficult if your beneficiaries after you're gone, your children, grandchildren never get sued or divorced. We can keep money in trust and make it less likely that it would be uh, going bye-bye to future ex-spouses or creditors. Uh, we can also do inherited IRA trusts where if you have the spendthrift child that uh, that would normally take the, the, uh, the lump sum of your million dollar IRA, we could force them into a more reasonable uh, and more tax effective distribution. Uh, from there, we can also turn it into special needs trust, discretionary trust, minors trust. So we call them modules. And so we start off with our base revocable living trust module. And then I can hang a number of modules off of that, whether it's the downstream asset protection, asset protection for my current clients or the inherited uh, qualified money trust. And so that way we are able to dial in the protection plan that's right for clients. For some, they never need anything more than the basic trust package. For some, they want all the modules, whether we do them day one or whether we, um, we're, we're in the process of, uh, of trademarking a term called the path, path to protection. And the idea behind that is that it doesn't have to be done day one. We can set up milestones where we're gonna do your base trust today, in two years, we're gonna handle the children's asset protection. Two years from there, we're gonna handle the IRA stuff. So it really doesn't stress the budget as much as trying to come in with a you know, 14 or $20,000 estate plan day one. We can start off much lower and over time, we can graduate into uh, that path to protection. That's very similar to what we're doing here uh, because of the business and estate planning uh, uh, combination of our practice. but. Uh, I'm glad to see that others are doing it too. And I think you've been very successful at it. Um, for the lawyers and other professionals who are listening out there, tell me the secret to your success and how, uh, what challenges you've had to overcome. Well, you know, early in the practice, um, I'm very good at positioning value. If, if I can say that I'm, I'm really good at one thing, it's explaining con difficult concepts to people in a way that they can understand. And so mm -hmm. uh, my close ratio uh, for consultations is usually around 90% of the people I meet with hire me. And that's, a, that's good. And it also creates um, some challenges as far as production. So early in my career, I was selling all day. And then I was, I was making the sauce. I was the one doing the drafting. I was the one doing the executions of the, the, the estate plans. And so there's only so much time yep. in the day. So I found myself working from you know, eight in the morning until six or seven at night, I'd go home. At that time I had a, a six month old. And so I'd spend some time with him. And as soon as he went down, I'd come back to the office about 8.30 at night, work until about 3.30 in the morning. By the time I got home, got to bed, it was four. And then he was up at 5.30. So oh I, I was a younger man then. And I did it about <laughs> two to three days a week. And I really started feeling the burnout. And so I remember that, that friction point was one of I either need to take less cases um, and I just have a personal uh, problem with telling someone who trusts me and wants to write me a check to help their family. Thank you, but no thank you. So I, I have a really hard time turning down people that want to write me checks. So I was burning the midnight oil trying to get it all done. And finally, I said, I need help. And so I, I never forget my, my first uh, employee who's still with me to this day. Uh, or my first paralegal drafter for my estate plans. And, you know, she wanted a fair rate, uh, what she was asking for. But for me, it seemed like a lot of money because I was such a small shop. It was me and, right. you know, two, two assistants. And it, I had to think about it. But once I did that and I realized, and I asked myself the question, is it, I'll just make up a figure. Let's say it's $60,000 a year for an employee. I had to really ask myself the hard question, would I take 60,000 out of my pocket at the end of the year and toss it over, uh, over the wall in exchange to get my nights and weekends back? And once I looked at it that way, I said, absolutely every day of the week and twice on Sundays, because I was 35 years old and getting burned out and it's way too early to get burned out in your profession. So I took that model and I said, yeah, I'll give away X 
in order to retrieve my nights and weekends with my family. It was the best thing I did. And from there, the light bulb went off. And as soon as I got her busy at capacity, I said, all right, we need another one and another one and another one. And so now um, I have 28 staff, which is mm-hmm. way more than most estate planning. Certainly elder law attorneys in Florida, it's usually uh, you know one attorney and one or two assistants. That's the, that's the Medicaid boutique firm. And one of the things that makes us successful is that we have such a large team that I, I, I can tell people as a marketing standpoint, every one of my Medicaid clients, veterans clients has four team members working on your case. You have a lead attorney, senior case manager, junior case manager, and paralegal. And people say, well, you know, you're, you're more expensive than some of your competitors. And I say, absolutely I am, but I have more people working on your mom's case than the other guy has in the entire business. So when Medicaid throws a curveball to one of our clients in process, other firms have to prioritize and figure out who's going to go on the back burner so that we can put out the fire. In my model, we can put out multiple fires multiple times a day and we have the right staffing. So the the blessing is that I don't really have to do a lot of the production. I have trained my staff. They do the drafting. Everything comes to me, obviously, for review before it goes out to the client. But right. if they've done you know, 10,000 of them, they're pretty darn good. And there's not a whole lot of, hey, you missed this provision and we need to rewrite this. Um, so I'm always available to my staff, but I really have uh, fashioned myself into, you know, for lack of a, a cliche, the rainmaker. I bring in the business, I hand it off to my staff. They take it from there, draft it, I review it. They handle the execution. Uh, and I'm just, just there for my clients to answer questions and be a resource. But other than that, I'm bringing in new business. And so last question. Yeah. What happens if something happens to you, to all those 28 people? So uh, we do have a succession plan. I have uh, three that attorneys that work in my practice. Uh, one who is very young. Uh, she was an intern and she is groomed eventually if I get hit by the beer truck or retire to take over the practice. So we do have continuity built in. Um, so the upside is we have a lot of staff. The downside is we have a lot of overhead and that overhead causes some sleepless nights at times. So don't think it's, it's all, uh, it's all clouds and rainbows, but, uh, <laughs> but overall it really works. At least it works for us. Yeah. You know, there's a sign, uh, right over your head that, uh, has the lead on it that says entrepreneur. And I, I define you as the ultimate on- ultimate entrepreneur because you've done it from the beginning and you've set it up so that if something does happen to you, the beer truck, the milk truck, or what, there is no milk truck anymore. But if something runs you over and you can't be there any longer, um, you've got it set up so that there's a good business succession plan. So these people can continue working for you and families can continue to be served. And I, I applaud you for that. Congratulations. I appreciate it. That they, what you may not be able to read under entrepreneur, it says, uh, a person willing to work a hundred hours a week for themselves to avoid working 40 hours a week for someone else. For somebody else. <laughs> well, I, I, that's, you know, I'm going to include that quote in my book. I think that's great. Um, and thank you so much for being a special guest on Blueprint for, for Well. We always uh, offer free talking- consultations. So if anybody's interested or just has any questions, I'm always a resource. My staff is a resource. Um, we don't charge for questions um, because we feel if we properly educate the public, um, enough of them will see a value in our services that they'll want to retain us. So my model is not a uh, charge for everybody who has a question or an email. What's your website? Uh, www.mortelerolaw.com. That's M-O-R-T-E-L-L-A-R-O. And you can find us at fortressassetprotection.com. Awesome. Thanks for being a special guest on Blueprint for Wealth, Michelangelo. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, sir. All right. And everybody, uh, I hope you got a lot of good information about that. And if you're planning on moving to Florida, you better talk to this guy about Medicaid planning or veterans planning or estate planning, because he truly is an expert in that area. Thanks for listening to Blueprint for Wealth. And we'll see you next time for a special guest and a special topic. Have a great week.